welcome to our service. Whether you are a regular listening live through Facebook or um, later in the day on the YouTube or website, or perhaps you've found us online for the first time and you're checking us out, um, I trust you'll really enjoy and be blessed by what you hear uh, today. The theme of today's service is mission. And we're going to be hearing from various people about different aspects of mission that we support and are connected with as a church. We also have an inspiring talk by Andy Quayle, and I believe he will challenge us and help us reflect about our personal and corporate involvement in mission as individuals and as a church together. One of the truths that um, came through to me as I prepared for this service is that our God is a missionary God whose heart is full of love for the vulnerable, the downtrodden and the persecuted. He's not satisfied with the 99 sheep that are in the pen, but he goes after the one sheep that is lost and he inspires us to do the same. <clears throat> Let me read you some words from Psalm 146, uh, starting at verse 7. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. Bob Pierce, who was founder of, the world, of world Vision, wrote this simple one-line prayer that could be a very dangerous prayer to pray. He said this, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. As we listen to the worship songs and the various people taking part, I pray that we will be open to the voice of God and what he has to say to each one of us. So let's pray. So fill us with your love that it might cascade into the ordinariness of our working lives and others experience the warmth of its flow spreading from hearts and words and deeds, an unbroken stream bringing refreshment to all that it touches. Amen.
abruptness with which we went into lockdown meant that messy church, toddlers and kids groups just stopped. Quite apart from getting over the idea that we would no longer meet together, nor how long the lockdown would last, we were quite unprepared as to how we were going to stay in touch. Being together, interacting with one another, building relationships through spending time in each other's company is the very essence of our local mission. Demonstrating and sharing the love God has for all people is so much easier when you're face to face, more challenging when you're told to stay in your home. Or is it? More than ever I'm convinced that we're not meant to be isolated and bit by bit it's been possible to maintain contact with various groups and bring people together virtually. So thank you Zoom. Oh the joy of actually seeing one another again. However, some things have worked and some things have not. So here's the lowdown during lockdown. Messy Church has been running in St Clears for 10 years. We've had many families join us for varying periods of time over those years. It was the one group I thought would be easiest to maintain through Facebook and yet it's been the hardest and the most challenging. It was lovely working with our team of helpers on the service a couple of weeks ago, yet despite contacting families to include them, there was little response. Families I know have had a very stressful time during lockdown, working from home, homeschooling children, and restricted access to friends and family to help with childcare. So we continue to pray for our messy families, for opportunities to meet and support them, and also for the future of Messy Church at St Clears. Around the second week in April, we started a toddler Zoom. Initially, it was just an ad hoc get together, but we said we would meet again the following week from about 10.30 for half an hour. And so we have ever since. Friday at 10.30, helpers, mums and children meet up on Zoom for a sing song, courtesy of Brian with his guitar, a story time, and some folks have even been, been known to wear silly hats. It's a precious time and one that will continue hopefully until we can actually meet again for real. More recently we've started a Sunday morning kids group, again on Zoom, for the young people of St Clears. We meet at half past nine for half an hour and we're using an amazing resource from Together at Home. And currently we're following the early church in Acts. Ed helps with the IT and we enjoy stories, singing, prayers and even have time for some craft. And again, we aim to continue through the summer, so would value your prayers for our young people. All of these activities, we welcome anyone who would like to take part, help or get involved in any way. So do get in touch with me, Lynn Samble. God bless. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm going to start this morning by reading from Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We first start in the Philippines. Sarah is a believer from a Muslim background and a single mother of three in the southern Philippines. On the 20th of March, Sarah's entire city was placed under lockdown. All forms of public transport were suspended. Business establishments were not allowed to operate unless they were providing for basic needs. School lessons were already suspended, even before the lockdown was declared. Within the first two weeks of the lockdown, Sarah and her children received food aid from Open Doors, which greatly helped Sarah and other believers from Muslim backgrounds during this difficult time. But as a community quarantine continued, the strict observation of lockdown were imposed in the city. Sending and getting help became very challenging. 
Sarah tried her best to make both ends meet, but there were times when they skipped one meal in order to extend their food supply. But even though they scrimped, they began to run out of food. During this time, Sarah's trust and confidence in the Lord was put to the test. Even though she had no assurance of when this situation would end, Sarah resolved to put her hope and trust in the Lord alone. The Lord has never failed Sarah and her family. His provision is unexpected, but always timely. The Lord is indeed good. Sarah shared with an Open Doors partner, his provision is always on time. Every time we run out of food, his provision would come, just in time for our next meal. Like Sarah, other believers from Muslim backgrounds are also experiencing the same thing. Most of them don't receive much help from the government. If they do, the relief goods only last for a week or a few days. But their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is sustaining them during this difficult time. So we now move on to India. In the UK and Ireland, we're still being very cautious about meeting friends and family and as a church. But as lockdown measures gradually ease, things are getting worse for our brothers and sisters in India. Each day the numbers of new cases is higher than the day before and the country has reported at least 18,000 new cases each day for the past five days. Sadly, Christians are still likely to be the last in line to receive vital food and aid. Hina and other Open Doors partners in the region have met many Christians who have been denied help explicitly because of their faith. It's difficult to deal with all these requests, but we have no choice, says Hina. We need to continue to help our brothers and sisters. Despite the critical health risks, we do not stop distributing rations and supplies wherever we can. And finally, a church in Sri Lanka that was attacked last September has provided food for its neighbours, including the attackers. With the assistance of Open Doors, Pastor Shiath's church was able to provide dry rations for a hundred families through the local government representative in their village. Even the people who had attacked believers from the church last September received packs of essential goods and were deeply moved by the gesture. Later, they discussed this amongst themselves. The church could have just helped their own believers. They didn't have to help us. But they did. Why did we do so much against them, they asked. This act of love has opened new doors to reach out to that community, Pastor Shiath shared. Doing this gave us more opportunities to share the gospel and to show the love of Christ to people. More people are eager to know the Lord. I see a great renewal within the church. Even the local government representative in the village has changed his attitude towards a Christian's community. We are building better relationships with people now. As you can see, there are so many of our brothers and sisters around the world who are struggling, but their faith remain strong. Their love for Jesus is huge. And so I'm going to refer, uh, hand over now to Terry who is going to lead us in a short prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are God who loves us all equally, whatever our situation in life. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are blessing our brothers and sisters all around the world. Lord, we give thanks that aid is getting to so many people and that through your love and the love of Jesus Christ, they are willing to share all they get with families around them. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you watch over our brothers and sisters around the world for those who are struggling at this moment in time, for those who don't know where their next meal will come from. And Lord, we just give thanks that their faith is strong in you, that the love they show for you is being shown to their neighbours. Father, we just ask this prayer to your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you soon. And keep praying for our brothers and sisters around the world, please. Thank you. Going to India has shown me the real depth to the Bible words, brothers and sisters in Christ. When I think of the girls at the Michael Job Centre, dear Mary Job, and all those who are involved in caring for them, the emotions evoked are those experienced for family members. In March, MJC were told to lock its gates, allowing no outsiders in, and like all of India, delivery of post or by couriers was stopped. On the positive side, by being in complete isolation from the start, they are still all safe at the centre and have all the basic necessities. With all India's schools and colleges suspended, all the day pupils are not on the campus. The Sabina hostel girls have been advised to stay in their bedrooms. Conscious this is a big ask, Koshi and his wife Liz have organised regular online counselling for small groups of girls. The girls watch the TV news together in the lobby every afternoon and evening so they know what is happening in the world. It was really pleasing to hear that the hostel library is in constant use the first time since Loving Action started it over 10 years ago. The new project we supported last year was the setting up of a sewing room and I can now see how God had prepared the facilities so it was ready for the girls to make their masks in. In 2015, the first online classroom was installed in an endeavour to address the major financial concerns of providing high quality teachers. Little did we realise at the time that by furthering this venture and having extensive digital infrastructure in place, 
MJC would be able to continue providing edu education for their girls in these unprecedented times. An added bonus is that Google have also made their programs totally free as MJC is an educational institution focusing on underprivileged children. God is so good. At the start of lockdown, thankfully, dear Mary Job was somehow persuaded by her brother to not go to her Delhi medical clinic as she was in her 70s. But her younger relative, Rennie, who lives with Mary, is a nurse in one of the city's hospitals. So there is still a real danger of the virus coming into her home. Being such a densely populated nation, it has always been a great concern should the coronavirus get out of control in India. And as, positive, as poverty is widespread there, it makes the concern more prevalent. For me, it is not the current escalating numbers the media is reporting that are affecting me. But the heartfelt words my brothers and sisters from different states are now stating, such as that the virus is increasing severely day by day, the pandemic is getting so dangerous over here. And from Lydia, one of the Michael Job's girls who left last year to get married, she said, here in India, the situation is getting more worse. Keep praying for us, Auntie. The main video clip earlier was of the girls worshipping, stood outside their bedrooms in the hostel because they can't go to the chapel. For 20 years, every day has started with the hostel girls worshipping and praying. I know I don't pray for them all as often as I should, but I am thankful for the opportunity to say some prayers for them today and hope you will join with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Michael and John Job Centre and all that you have provided for the girls and dedicated staff who have called it their home. We pray that you will continue to keep them safe from this virus and may they still find joy in their reduced environment and in drawing closer to you. As Joseph and Babu are responsible for the lives of so many girls, please also give them an extra sense of your daily peace. We thank you, God, for dear Mary Job and her compassionate heart. Please abundantly bless your faithful servant with your continual presence. Please meet Koshi at his point of need in body, mind and spirit, as incredibly his burdens increase at this time in his position as head of MJC. For the young women who have already left MJC, and other Christians in India. Father, we ask that you watch over them and keep them strong and safe for your glory. For India as a nation, we pray that your will be done during this pandemic. We ask all these prayers in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, hi, Tim. Um, it looks like you've got a little bit more interesting background than, than I've got. Uh, and I think you're down in Devon. I am um, at the moment, yeah. I'm up in Somerset. But thanks for um, just making a bit of time to talk to me about Mpongwe. Um, uh, some people looking in today might not know much about Mpongwe and our involvement as a church with it and as a charity. Um, You've been involved with it and now you've taken over my role as chairman. So you're the man to talk to about this. So give us a flavour of what we've been up to over the last few years, um, you know, with people who don't know much about it in sure. mind. Sure. Well, thank you, Ant, and, and thank you everyone at St. Clear's for uh, giving me the opportunity just to share a little bit about uh, Mpongwe's people, uh, which really exists to support the work of the Mpongwe Baptist Association. Uh, the MBA was established uh, in the 1930s as a mission base uh, with a hospital and a church 
uh, and over the past uh, few decades has grown to cover uh, a large area of a very rural region of Zambia. Uh, it covers over 180 churches, got a thriving uh, mission hospital there, uh, a lot of different activities going on. And uh, in 2007, after a visit to uh, Mpongwe that uh, a number of us uh, were part of, we set up Mpongwe's people to really support the work that goes on through the MBA. So we do all kinds of different things. Um, the main focus is really building relationships and we've sent teams and many people from St. Clair's will have been on teams out to Mpongwe and that's really important. The renovation of uh, the hospital, which uh, Mpongwe's people has been a, a real key partner with um, and, and various other projects that we've been involved with. And like you, um, and I lived in Mpongwe for a few months. Uh, you were there for a bit longer than that, but um, yeah, I was out there. So, so really kind of got a feel and a heart for the place and for all the ministry that goes on there. Yeah, super. Thanks, Tim. Um, but what are we currently focusing on? You know, what's the, the, the main project that we're involved in through Mpongwe's people? Perhaps talk us through that. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Anne. So probably around uh, maybe six or seven years ago, we started in partnership with the Mpongwe Baptist Association, a programme for orphans and vulnerable children. So we currently support around 150 children who are vulnerable. Um, they're often living with members of their extended family. Uh, if they are orphans or for whatever reason, their family can't support them. And so uh, we have a, a staff and, and volunteers who identify these children uh, and then what we do is we sponsor them uh, primarily through their schooling. So they, say, so they live in their villages, they live with members of their extended family, but then we sponsor them to be able to go to school. We pay for their uniforms, uh, any other equipment and bits and pieces that they need because education is so key in lifting these communities, lifting these people out of poverty. Uh, and so for the children day to day, uh, we, um, uh, we help them with, with schooling costs. Uh, we have a team of volunteer caregivers. We support them with bicycles and other bits and pieces so they can uh, visit these children and making sure that they're going to school and getting the care that, um, that they really need. So that's probably at the moment our biggest focus and what we're really involved in right now. Super, yeah. And um, a more general question to perhaps finish off with. Mm. Um, so we've got a strong link um, or a strong link with St. Clear's Chapel has been very important part of the story of Mpongwe's people with individuals um, to be, uh, sorry, with many people visiting Mpongwe over the years. Mm. Um, why do you think it's important for us as a church and individuals to be involved and support overseas mission? Yeah. Then we have enough to do, you know, locally. Yeah, yeah, sure. And and thank you, Anne. That's a, it's a great question. And we are so, so thankful for the involvement with St. Clair's uh, within Mpongwe's people over the years. I think, you know, um, on, a, on a general level, um, our God is a missionary God. He's a sending God. He sends, uh, mission just means to send, and, you know, he sends his son into the world. Um, and he sends us into the world. And yes, that is uh, the, our local context, but it's also our international context as well, that God is sending us into the world with his message of, of love and to demonstrate that through good works. And I don't think that we can really read the Bible without noticing God's heart for the oppressed, without noticing God's bias towards the poor and people who are vulnerable. Uh, and so really it's, a privilege to be joining with God in his mission to the world. Uh, and, and, and I think there's something about this kind of cross-cultural mission that is such a blessing for us. It changes us, you know, uh, and I know your testimony is the same, man, that uh, spending time in a place like uh, Mpongwe absolutely changes mm -hmm. uh, us individually. But I think also it gives us uh, a, a really kind of healthy view of the world and what God is doing in the world that keeps us out of our little bubble and you know really help connects us with God's heart for the poor so yeah hugely important but also a massive blessing to be involved in 
in that kind of work really yeah yeah lovely yeah so true um well i'm going to ask you to pray um for mpongwe and the situation out there and all the work of Mpongwe's people. I know there's been a, an issue with the bank account. Um, we've mentioned it in the prayer chain and in Sunday page, but just in the last few days, that seems to have opened up again and we're able to get donations coming in. Um, so that's a great relief. But um, yeah, can I just hand over to you to just bring all these matters in prayer? Before yeah, thanks, Yeah, I'd love to. Let's pray. Thanks, pray. Tim. Father, thank you for what you are doing in the world. Thank you for your heart, as we've been talking about just now, that you, that you love people with, a, with an abounding love, that your heart is towards those who society so often forgets. And Father, for all the kids and the partners and the people that we know and love in Zambia, or even people that are unknown to us but known to you father we pray a blessing upon them we ask that uh, through this small work that you would pour out your spirit upon them that you would uh, provide for these kids and that through the little that we can do there would be a, a, a coming out of poverty from many of these children uh, our father we we ask that for those that don't have parents as they owe of, of their own Lord that you would be a father to them but for those that are in difficult uh, painful circumstances uh, and we really have no idea some of the things that these kids go through Lord we ask that you would in a very real and, and, and specific way demonstrate your love to them father that yes that they would be able to go to school and receive practical help but so much more that they would know that they have a father in heaven who loves them who is calling them to to himself so yeah help us with our with this this work and then um, lord for those who are on the ground in zambia for the caregivers for the directors for the staff over there we pray your wisdom your blessing and your guidance for them in jesus name amen 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 thanks tim and uh, enjoy your weekend down in sunny devon thanks so much i really appreciate it thank you Hi, my name is Miriam Shafuti. I'm the Orphans and Vulnerable Children Coordinator here in Impongwe District. Uh, right now, we have a trip going to Kanyenda. We're going to Kanyenda. Uh, also, we're going to visit schools like uh, schools like Kasamba, Minkoyo, and also Kanyenda Secondary School. Uh, there we are going to pay the school fees, we are going to get the school progress for all the children that we are, we are sponsoring. And in that district we have about um, 11 children that we are going to meet. Yes. I'm a sprinter banda, the head teacher at Kanyenda Secondary School. Um, apparently, we have about 906 pupils, and among the those, um, close to 200 are open. The father of that child has died. So I'm the guardian of that child. The problem I'm facing myself, I always say I'm 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 not well in, I'm not well, but uh, I used to keep that uh, person, that child. 
I'm the one who's carrying that child. So it's great granddaughter then? Yes. Okay, wow, that's amazing. The older ones of you listening to the service this morning may remember a wonderful radio programme, Letter from America by Alistair Cook. He would meander around seemingly random events in the world over the previous week, viewed from his perspective in America, and then, as if by magic, draw them all together at the end to make some profound point about the world. I'm no Alistair Cook. But I hope you will bear with me while I meander around some of my own personal experiences of Christian mission. My hope is that it may remind and encourage all of us to explore further and perhaps spark your interest to support organisations and channels of mission you may have never heard of before or have forgotten about. It all began for me with a little book. Again, you have to be old to remember the Ladybird books about famous people. There were ones about Horatio Nelson and Francis Drake and Florence Nightingale, but the one that really got me excited was the one about David Livingston. This remarkable man came from the poorest of homes in Scotland. There were seven children living in a one-bedroom tenement in Blantyre, and he spent from age 14 to 26 working 14-hour days in the cotton mill, but still managed in his downtime to attend school qualify as a doctor and become a national hero in Victorian Britain. He is sometimes sneered at as a perceived pay failure uh, in modern times, but what a life he lived. He explored southern Central Africa around the Zambezi River, was the first European to see Mosi Oatunya. And while they are spectacular and worth a visit if you've never seen them, as one American visitor wrote home, seen Vic Falls, sell Niagara. Bought Arab slave traders, freeing the Africans they were taking to the coast to sell, and was attacked by a lion, and was once also charged by an angry rhino. Livingston initially worked at Kuruman in northern Botswana. That's the country uh, just north of South Africa and to the left of Zimbabwe with his father-in-law, Robert Moffat. Amazing Victorian patriarch, scary beard though, who encouraged him to go to the vast plains to the north of Botswana, where he, Moffat, had glimpsed the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary had ever been. Livingston visited an area once where there were many lions terrorising the villagers. They stated, the lion, the lord of the night, kills our cattle and sheep even in the daytime. Livingston felt that if he could kill just one lion, the others would take it as a warning and leave the villagers and their livestock alone. Therefore, he led the villagers on a lion hunt. Seeing a large lion, he fired his gun, but the animal was not sufficiently injured to prevent him from attacking him while reloading, seriously wounding and breaking his left arm. Although believing the Holy Spirit was for all men and he, that he was there to bring the gospel, Livingston had been greatly influenced by abolitionists that the African slave trade might be destroyed through the influence of legitimate trade and the spread of Christianity. He advocated the establishment of trade and religious, religious missions in Central Africa, but the abolition of the African slave trade, as carried out by the Portuguese and Arab Swahili, became his primary goal. His motto, now inscribed on his statue at Victoria Falls, was Christianity, commerce and civilization, a combination that he hoped would form an alternative to the slave trade and impart dignity to the Africans in the eyes of the Europeans. 
All the aspiring real doctors um, who were there on the day climbed up onto this statue that overlooks the falls for this photo. You can see Mikey Cotton, whom some of you know, and his son Arthur, as well as Alice and me. My father's best friend at Bristol University was a medical student, Arthur Wright. Arthur was the star student of his generation, winning most of the medical prizes. His father owned George Wright and Sons, who published the classic surgical books that my generation of doctors grew up with. An extremely successful medical career beckoned. But he and his friends had been deeply troubled about the stories coming out of the Congo about the treatment of the Africans by their Belgian colonial masters. It is estimated some 10 million Africans died, with anyone challenging their rule having their hands chopped off. Indeed, Arthur and his group of friends believed that the destruction of Belgium in the First World War was God's judgment for the Belgians' treatment of the Congolese. However, it was 1939 and Arthur received his call-up papers to attend screening for active war service. In his interview, he told the recruitment officer that he believed that God was calling him to work in the Congo, to which he received the amazing reply, then we had better not stand in God's way, had we? And so it was that he and his wife ended up moving to the depths of what was immortalised by Joseph Conrad as the heart of darkness, founding a mission hospital which they ran for 40 years. During their time there, the Congolese rebellion broke out. I can remember my parents praying every morning at breakfast time. Family prayers were much more part of family life in those days, for their safety. There were horror stories coming back from the Congo of missionaries being disemboweled while still alive. So the time came when Arthur and Betty were in grave danger and had to leave. However, with the rebels on the edge of the hospital compound, a pregnant lady arrived at the hospital needing a caesarean section and Arthur had to go back into the hospital to perform this before escaping just in the nick of time. For a child of eight or nine with no television, certainly not colour TV, no package holidays to take you to exotic exciting places or the aircraft to evacuate you if you got into trouble, the thought of being a mission doctor was the most exciting thing I could imagine. James Bond, Simon Reeve, Bear Gryllis all rolled into one and squared. I was passionate about sport. We lived in rugby at the time and on my walk to school I used to pass rugby school where William Webb Ellis was supposed to have picked up a, a, a soccer ball and so invented rugby football. My ambitions were to play rugby for England at Twickenham and to be a mission doctor. David Livingstone and Arthur Wright represent the classic view of missionaries, men and some remarkable women too, called to travel to another country to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and to bring hope and release from evil in some very dark places. Jackie Pullinger, who grew up with Judy Hurley, working with the triad gangs in the Forbidden City in Hong Kong also comes to mind. But modern mission is much wider. We no longer live in a society where the Christian gospel is the prevailing life informer. So home mission has become more important, reaching out to our neighbours and the communities where we live. In an increasingly dysfunctional society, there are many more hurting people so there are very many people waiting to hear and be healed by the good news of Jesus, for whom we are to be his hands and feet. It starts at an individual level with our friendships, then moves to a church level. We've heard from Lynn about Messy Church. And there are plenty of those listening today uh, for whom the Alpha Groups at St Clears have been your introduction to Jesus. Bigger than our local church are organisations at a national level. For example, the Salvation Army, who for more than a century have cared for the most downtrodden members of society. As a young casualty officer in London, I, I had great regard for the Salvation Army, who cared for the uh, homeless, smaller than, number than there are now, who were mainly uh, alcoholics and who lived under the 
uh, archers at Waterloo or in, in a Salvation Army hostel. And much newer ones like Christians Against Poverty, who have rapidly become one of the biggest providers of debt advice in the country. The need remains still, though, for people and organisations to take the gospel to parts of the world where Jesus' name is not yet known, or where the compassion that Christianity should bring to society has not penetrated. As liberal theology increasingly took over the Western Church at the beginning of the 20th century, a separation developed between these two aspects of God's kingdom. It was the pure gospel or the social gospel. Fortunately, this divide has been healed with organisations like Tear Fund, seeing the two indivisibly linked, with the church re-empowered to care for the needs of their members and non-members. As someone said, the church is the only organisation that exists for its non-members. And just as Karen and Terry prayed, there is also a huge need to support Christians who appear persecuted just there because they follow Jesus. These are brick workers in Pakistan that Barnabas Fund are supporting. Christians are by far the most persecuted group of people in the world, with possibly up to 10,000 martyred every year. And this is increasing in atheist, Muslim, Hindu and Buddhist countries especially whereas so often they are from the poorest members of society. The picture in the left hand top corner of a VW Beetle and a rather shifty individual standing beside it is very dear to my heart. Um, it's um, of Brother Andrew, who is one of my all time heroes, who took Bibles into communist countries before it was safe to do so. And the rather uninteresting picture on the right top corner is um, of uh, represents uh, a shipment of a million Bibles that were smuggled into China on one day. So how can we support mission nowadays? Perhaps even you feel you're being called to be a missionary yourself. Most of these early missionaries had a very clear sense of calling. In my twenties, as I considered my future, I had a very strong sense of wanting to be in the right place, in the centre of God's will, that life was a bit like a treasure hunt, where you had to end up with the right answer to your current clue. But if you missed it, then you were scuppered, second best for the rest of your life. God guides us in many ways. The Bible, wise Christian friends, our own common sense and circumstances. A sense of peace can be an important component but it mustn't be elevated beyond what it is. I think it was Spurgeon who said about feelings, if one is a serious traveller, then bad weather will not curtail my journey. However, God does put things on our hearts, and when we choose to take these up and run with them, he permits remarkable things to happen. The decision is entirely ours though. We're not to lie back thinking it is super spiritual for us to expect God to dictate what our choice should be. This was the risk he took with man in the Garden of Eden. But as we are renewed in his likeness, he delights in our making decisions that please his heart. The truth is that we are all called to be missionaries, sharing the good news of Jesus. But if you believe God has put something specific on your heart, have courage and go for it. I did make it eventually to Africa, working at Bethesda Hospital here in New Bombo in KwaZulu-Natal. And Sarah too, who was born while we lived there, went back to work for Scripture Union after school. How can we support mission? Well, this wisdom extends to our support for Christian missionary organisations, particularly at this time when some charities seem to have lost their way with major scandals. It is not surprising this happens though, as we are in a spiritual battle with our enemy the devil, prowling around seeking to mess up any godly activities. So we are called on to be very wise in considering whom we support and how we, we do so, whether this be financial, in praying, or even going to work as missionaries ourselves. For giving, it can be useful to take out a charitable account with someone like stewardship, that enables one to pick and choose 
whom you support while getting back your gift aid automatically. As Christians, the Old Testament requirement to tithe has been superseded. Indeed, we give our whole lives to him when we become Christians, and we're called on to be generous. But the best measure of generosity I have ever heard is that it is not what you give, but what you have left over when you have given. Some of us score very badly on this measure. Start small is good advice, and don't promise too much, as God keeps us to our word. Look on it as a bit like investing in shares. Go for the ones where God seems to be working, so you get a big dividend for your money. I don't have any shares at the moment, but this is way more fun. Read around their literature and websites. I do particularly re recommend Bible Society in this respect, with lots of amazing stories of what God has done in people's lives. All this applies to praying too, but here the dividends are even bigger. Think of the five loaves and two fishes. Many publish prayer diaries, online or paper, which can be useful to help focus one's prayers. Praying can change a dysfunctional organisation into a Holy Spirit breed life changer, but on the whole we will probably want to pray for some proven effective organisations. Some of the organisations to consider. Counties, who among other things run the Somerset camps our youngsters go to and have close connections with St Clears. Scripture Union also, who provide training and materials for children and run camps like counties. Livability, who provide care for disabled people. And our very own Mpongwe's people. If you, so the pictures show some of the many things that we have achieved in Mpongwe over the last 10 years. A much respected organisation in the countries where leprosy is sadly still common is the Leprosy Mission. Often these countries are antagonistic towards the Christian gospel. Another fantastic organisation is MAF providing air transport to inaccessible areas of the world for other Christian organisations and NGOs. And Bible Society, always looking for new ways for people to engage with the scriptures. See too there, Open the Book, now going worldwide. They've already reached some 800,000 children. So what am I, Alistair Cook, or perhaps more Kevin MacLeod, final pulling together thoughts on mission. Well, Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven were, go and make disciples of all nations. So it's not optional. We're all called to mission. There are many ways to involve ourselves, but we need to be wise about how we do this. But above all, go for it if God puts something on your heart. And if it scares you a bit, just remember, as D.L. Moody said, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody, 40 years learning he was nobody, and 40 years discovering what God could do with a nobody. Share it for me.
I'm very thankful to everyone who took part this morning and uh, I think we've all been challenged by what we've heard. Um, there's lots to think about and I want to just end with uh, a few quotes that I think can help inspire us. There's a quote that has been attributed to John Wesley um, that says, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And it was Teresa of Avila, um, that saintly uh, person who lived almost 500 years ago, I think, who said this, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. <coughs> Let's pray. Father God, please help us to recognise the mission fields that you give to each one of us. For many of us, that will be right on our doorstep or even within our families. For some of us, it may be further afield. Please give us the courage to respond when you call us, believing you will equip us with all we need to get that job done. Please continue to speak to us this week as we think about and respond to what we have heard today and to seize the opportunities you give us to show your grace and love to those around us and to be generous with our time, talents and treasure. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And then a final prayer of blessing. Lord Jesus Christ, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.